Thanks, Dave. And uh, just watch out for Dave if there is a fire because he'll be pushing out of the road to get outside first. <laughs> Seinfeld style. Um, and welcome again, everybody. Um, our first uh, presenter today uh, is Ian McLean. Ian is Managing Director of Bush Agribusiness and is a consultant in the, uh, to pastoral companies um, or pastoral businesses in the northwest and regional areas of Australia. Um, Ian's joining us over the internet today. And um, uh, the topic he's going to be talking about is something, as a consultant, we deal with all the time, and that's separating belief from fact. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fake news out there, and there's a lot of information out there, and um, as consultants, uh, we have to deal with it all the time. So uh, Ian's presentation is called Avoid Magic, Opt for Science. Ian. Righto. Good morning, Ed. Thank you. Can you... Can you hear me all right and see my presentation? Yep, perfect. Righto, very good. Uh, good morning all from Alice Springs. Sorry I couldn't be there in person today. I spent most of September in WA, but unfortunately that wasn't enough to, to qualify me for re-entry for this one, so having to do this one remotely. Um, as Ed has said, talk about avoiding magic and opting for science. And I want to talk about the importance of science and economics um, for the for the pastoral industry or for the beef industry, um, a bit about silver bullets, some objections I have to them, what I think you can do as livestock advisors, and some suggested readings. And happy to take questions throughout or or at the end. So, why is science and economics important? And I think you'll all have an understanding of this in your roles. But but science and economics, I think, underpin agriculture. And life. The, the advances that have been made over time have increased our, um, our life expectancy, quality of life in life and in agriculture have um, improved production, efficiency of production um, astronomically over time. And that, that all comes down to, to science and economics. And they are important. They're, they're not the only disciplines. There are others. Obviously, people and other things are important as well. But I think there are two of the, the key disciplines. And what I see my role as, as a livestock advisor, and uh, I think a lot of your role as well, is marrying that science and the economics with the production business at the coalface to be able to take the research that's been done, the knowledge that's out there, and work out with the producer how to implement that into their production system, I think is a, a large part of our role, a, a very important part of our roles. And I don't think you need to be a scientist or economist to do it. Um, I used to think you did, but now I think it's probably better that you're not. Um, but it's important to have the, an understanding of both science and economics if you're going to be able to give advice to producers that does have an impact on their bottom line. So. Science means many different things to different people, and there'll be, be people in the room that'll have a far better understanding of it than I do. But to me, it's understanding the scientific process, what that involves, having a control group, having replication, repeatability, ensuring that the process of the, all the findings have been peer reviewed, to me, are the, the fundamentals of science. And economics has many aspects, um, but at its core, I think ensuring that the, the incremental benefits from a change exceed the incremental costs at its most simple, does it pay? Understanding the economies of scale, understanding the concept of opportunity cost, understanding the time value of money. To me, that is the, the fundamentals of economics. And I think it's important without being a scientist or, a, or an economist, to have a working knowledge of that and to use it in your work day to day. It's not an easy process to, to be able to do this, I don't think. Um, there's lots of existing research and literature, lots of work being done by, by MLA, lots of good uh, reports and publications out there by MLA. There's lots of information in the peer reviewed literature covering agricultural production back a, a long time. It's a, a lot you know, big part. To, to get across it. I'm, I'm not across it as much as I'd, I'd like to be, um, but um, I do think it's important, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. 
and it's multidisciplinary. We've got science and economics, then within that we have um, genetics, nutrition, reproduction, biology, land management, um, dealing with people, all of those things. There's, there's lots of different aspects to it and there's to, to juggle there. And that, that is a challenge, but I think that's part of, part of our role. And one of, I think, the, the challenges with the, the more traditional extension and adoption role has been very good technical experts in these various areas. And the focus on that, and we need them, and they're important, and I'll talk about them a bit more later on. But come and say, well, we discovered X, Y, or Z, we can't understand why you're not doing it. But the, the producers, the way I look at it, they're the ones that are, are juggling all of these multidisciplinary things. Yes, they could introduce one thing, but they've got to weigh that up with the impact on their finances, the bottom line, the people in the business, all the other things they're juggling. It's not just a matter of implementing the latest bit of research, but we incorporate it into what is a quite complex management system in a lot of cases. That's what I see as a, a key role of livestock advisors to help them that juggle, understanding all the implications of it, because it's not just from, from what is um, and it is complex um, and it's at times conflicting where if you look into it, there's, there's different things on, on the same issue. And you've got probably one example, my focus on the, the North beef industry, um, the discussion going on on the, the importance of reproduction and also the, um, the application of, of phosphorus and there's conflicting information out there on it and you've got to be able to stick through all of that. And, um, and look at that, which is a challenge, but I think it's a, an important part of our role. The other challenge, I think, with regard to, to grazing systems, the livestock um, production systems, is the feedback loops can be quite low and indirect. And I'm sure a lot of you will know this already. Compared to the cropping industry, which has its own challenges, but in the cropping industry, if a, a new variety is introduced this year or a new fertiliser, or a new chemical. The benefits of that can be measured within that crop pretty easily and easy to have a control um, next to it and really identify that benefit. But for a producer, if they're going to introduce genetic by a couple of new bulls, and there can be a lot of things happen with the seasons, uh, mix it, other things coming in. If it might be three or four years before the results of that are seen, there'll be other things adding the water in the meantime. So that can make it uh, to adopt these things, see the, the benefits of them. That's why to have that and where that research as well is that in the application of it. And there are a lot of distractions and little books along the way. There's people out there that are peddling support, I think, and that, that adds to the challenge. And I want to talk about that a bit, I suppose, because um, they, they are a and they can be very particularly given the complexity of the product system. If someone comes along and says, look, why this process, or your, your landscape will become a utopia, or this will double your documents, or let's chuck a couple of drops in your trough, whatever the issue contains. Um, they're, they're very selective, they don't require a lot of thinking, and um, they can be very for people to go up to, but I think there are no sort of what's in micro and agriculture. It's not that simple. One that um, applied, and there are some companies. They are perhaps large with the knowledge, and people are free to implement whatever practices um, they want. But the few issues I think with, with some of the arguments that are out there at the moment, and this is what led to and myself, um, Dr. Sartre, the Forty Magic, not being the science, which was the background to being invited um, in today to talk about this. The issues I have, and I'll go through each of these one by one, is... Excuse me, Andy. Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're just having some connectivity issues. We'll just ask you to turn your video off. Um, normally that helps, and then hopefully your voice won't cut out in and out as much. Right. No worries, let me figure out how to do that here. Thank you. No, I'll just do that. Okay, right, go again. Yes, we can hear you, thanks. 
Okay, very good. Um, conventional agriculture is portrayed as archaic and unsustainable. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, the, the solutions are not in, always underpinned by rigorous government and economics, and there's a bit of magic involved. So I'll look at all of these um, in, um, in a bit more detail. So presenting it as a binary talk saying, well, conventional agriculture and that's all bad, and there's this new age approach, whatever it is, that's all good, and you're either with us or against us, and if it's conventional, that I think is is very divisive and it's it's disingenuous. It's not true. There's a, a bell curve out there in nature and life and you'll know this and see it. There's a broad spectrum um, in that culture. At one end there are those that, that are unsustainable, that are archaic, but at the other end there's some very switched on successful producers who do um, implement the latest research once they've weighed up into their production system and um, are really kicking goals. So presenting conventional agriculture as that um, all one group that's homogenous I think is, is misleading. Um, there is a tail to the industry though, and I think that that is a problem. Um, a tail might force culture, take a time to, to force them out. They can do through financial and environmental capital for decades, even if their businesses are unsustainable. And I think that impedes evolution of the industry and it presents a, a risk to the industry. Solidarity is admirable industry and, and I think sometimes we we defend them and do paint ourselves all as one, but sometimes I, I wonder whether it's counterproductive and whether the industry, the top half of the industry are off differentiating themselves from tail and saying what they're saying is the example, but don't paint agriculture with the suck brush, but it's just an, an opinion there. The science and economics, there, there is aspects of um, the new systems that are touted, which are very consistent with the established science, such as matching stock and account capacity, maintaining ground cover, which are all very sound established processes. And there may be some aspects of them which, which warrant rigorous research in the future to evaluate them, and they may be um, appealing. But um, there is um, the outdoor and pinned by science that has been established some of the practices. And just because one person is on their place and um, transformed it, or the person from South Africa, which seems to automatically have the ability to any um, grazing person and everyone thinks it's great, doesn't mean that it's scientifically or um, That has to be, be proven, I think, um, for the new systems that are coming in. A couple of examples of that, and I'll show you some links later. It's it's been very extensive research here overseas and found pretty consistently on the rangelands. It will be different in higher rainfall um, areas, but the grazing management trumps grazing system. If you match stock rate carrying capacity, have that season development, manage the three feet grasses, it doesn't matter how you do it, whether it's stocked or moved to lots, um, you get a good, re a good result. And when with the depreciation of paper, look, the cell growth is in that often make uneconomical, um, but it's still doubted as a solution um, and does have a positive aspect. The approach does keep people managing stock market capacity, looking for that, but it's the, the management that achieves the results, not the system, and that's been established pretty close once over time. Another one is the profitability of regenerative agriculture. It will work for some, as I've said, but there has been a report coming out saying that it's much more profitable than conventional agriculture. Um, John Francis, a respected South Wales consultant, did an analysis of this because some of um, the data was used and found that um, it, it didn't it really boost the return on assets. And um, put that out there, I'll show the paper as we go forward. Um, and I think it's important for all of you or us as, as livestock officers to do your own um, literature review, be across it. It is a challenge um, to be across the key bits of research that have been done so far and formed, and you do have a starting point to go through to calculate these things. Um, magic, uh, I don't like that there's yet elements of magic, burying cow or sprinkling stuff out or whatever 
or, or revealing secrets of this or that uh, doesn't really appeal to me. And I don't think there's any place for magic in agriculture beyond other nature. It's, um, it's science and economics, which may be a bit dry and boring, but that's the, um, the crux of it to me. There are some compelling arguments made, but I have heard where um, if people are trying to do these things and it's not working, um, they're told, oh, it's not working, it's because you aren't doing it right. Um, and I've heard that a few times. The other one is those that say it can't be done, get out of the road, those that are doing it, which is a pretty compelling argument. But I think we should start with those that say it can be done to produce irrefuted evidence that it, whatever it is, is both scientifically and economically sound. And scientifically, again, to me, the different interpretations of it is that any difference in production or profit is statistically significant. The work has been indicated, control group, et cetera, and the incremental benefits exceed the incremental costs from a point of view. Um, and others, if that's the case, happy to go for it. There's, there's proof there. But if not, um, then it needs to be, be looked at. What can you do or what can we do as livestock advisors? I think know the fundamentals and have an under relenting focus on them for whatever enterprise or region that you're operating in. And that's neither sexy nor so some of the new agents coming out are quite sexy. You focus on the fundamentals we aren't that sexy. But neither are that boring because once you get into it, there's a lot there. Lots of challenges, and the more you learn, the more there is to know. I just want to talk a bit about the fundamentals as I see them for Northern Beef, and this is an area where, where I work in, but I've still got a help a lot to learn. Um, but we think matching that stock rate to carrying capacity in short and long term, focusing on the third productivity, kilos of beef used per AE rather than the number of animals, the quality of production rather than the quantity of animals. Ensuring the discretionary food expenditure is well targeted is something that the better performers consistently do. Um, ensure there's efficient use of labour. Every full time equivalent should be managing between 1,500 and 2,500 AE, otherwise, the cost structure is too high. And operating scale. There's a, a scale threshold, like with it's very hard to have an economic um, or a profitable unit. Understanding that whether that's a constraint or not is important. It's also important to understand what aren't the fundamentals and largely for beef production, price received and extraction um, and um, shouldn't be focused on um, unless those fundamentals are, are addressed and can be done at minimum cost. What else can you do? I think to have a broad understanding of key research and publish papers of relevance to the whole industry and region. Have a library of the research and research papers. The MLA um, website's a good resource. I use EndNote, and I find that a good way of storing papers and filing them and having that information to go access um, if and when needed. Contribute to the literature. If you're doing work or finding something which you think adds to industry knowledge, get it out there, go through the, the peer review process. Um, I've only done that with the papers on this that I'm working on. So put out this brief report to, to try and contribute to industry knowledge and understanding. And I think that's a good way of being getting your own thoughts and processes clear and being able to defend them. Um, something I think is important. Build a relationship with the, the specialists, the technical experts, researchers. There's lots of people out there, that, including yourselves, that are passionate about in agriculture. Um, we can't, as advisors and being multidisciplinary, can't be experts in things. So I try and, and get to know the, the experts in nutrition and reproduction and genetics, build a relationship with them and, and go to them with questions, ask and also talk to them. They're happy to talk about what to see, what they're doing. Got out there. There's a lot of people on in agriculture that are, are working for the benefit of the industry, including um, MLA and putting events like this together. Getting to know them and using them as a, a resource, I think, is um, valuable. And you can be the, the connection between them and practitioners, like I said at the start, applying the science and economics in the, in the business. You can also, if someone suggests something, demand the evidence. 
for it and assess the economics of it. Um, advocate this scientific process. Acknowledge that it has shortcomings. It takes a long time to do it. Um, I come to scientists at the perfect the end of good, um, in that they wait for something because people so publish it, and there's some um, problems there. They may not um, fully understand the health implications, but it's pretty important to the test of time, and it's important, I think, we advocate for it. And we need to encourage people into it. Um, we're going to need bright lines in science, in industry, that see the big picture, not just for the silver bullets, perhaps largely nine, but for some of the people that are attacking industry calling for it to be shut down, we need the evidence to be able to, to counter that. So I think we need the, the right lines there. I'll also throw in a plug for the, the Ag Institute here, which I'm a member of. I think they've done some, some real good work in the last few years with setting up professional accreditation with CPA, CAG. Um, I've obtained a CAG, which part of agriculturalist um, level and that's important in terms of professional development, demonstrating that you have professional accreditation. And I encourage you to look at that because that's going to add weight to what you're doing. Um, the list of suggested um, reading here is the, the original article that um, this presentation is based on, it's available on their website understand these slides are going to be distributed to you, so you've got to get it all put there. Um, there's a, a paper in the um, uh, range of pathology of germs looking at reconciling people's perception of rotation grazing and what experimental evidence has uncovered. There's John Frank's paper I mentioned with looking at regenerative agriculture, um, a book review of the Call of the Red Wobbler, the regenerative agriculture one. Um, a paper I quite in particular like young people coming in is an evidence-based agricultural one. And there's also quite a good paper that last year that I want to look at the some of these alternative philosophies versus what's called scientists. And it, it highlights some of the shortcomings of scientists, which I think is good. So I recommend all of that to you as a starting point, and there'll be many others um, as well that are out there. So, We'll pull up there, Ed, and I'm happy to take any questions. There any? Thanks very much, Ian. That was fantastic. Um, any questions for Ian? Yep. Andrew, just one moment. Uh, my question relates to the human aspect of the silver bullet. Um, in my experience, a lot of these silver bullets seem to appeal to people's heartstrings as much as as their, their scientific knowledge. What they really want to, to do is, be, is to feel that they want to be, doing, to be seen to doing the right things, and that seems to suck them in. So I was just wondering, in your experience, how you dealt with the, dealing with the emotional component? Um, good question. I'd, um, you're right, that is something that gets people in and a, um, a school of thought that I don't subscribe to it, you never go broke selling farmer hope. I think some of this is, is based on that. I think um, the only way to do it is counter it with science, with evidence and, um, and show an alternative that the scientific approach can seem pretty boring. There's lots of sifts that have been through, but, but provide an alternative that is evidence-based is the only answer I've got to that. So, Ian, I suppose moving on from that, that's a it's a delicate discussion when someone's because ultimately you're wanting to have have a win and get them to understand it, but they might be coming from a completely different direction. And I suppose just following up from that, uh, any tips for? having that discussion with people for getting that, making that change from belief to fact? No, that, that's the, the big challenge of extension and adoption, I think. And I think that my approach, and, and I'm still learning on this, is is understanding that juggle that I spoke about before. That it is a multidisciplinary thing and there's lots of, of very good technical experts that come in focusing on one area. But at the end of the day, it's up to the producer to be the one that's 
that's juggling all the different aspects and has to weigh up all the different parts of it, the family, the business, the finances. You know, just, I suppose, acknowledging that, understanding that, trying to see that from, from their perspective and um, um, help them. My approach is, you know, if we can help them make an informed decision for that juggle, not ask up to us to tell them what to do, they're the decision makers, but if we can help them sort of weigh up everything there and, and see the evidence, then um, that that will happen. Yeah, is my approach to it. Like I said, I'm, I'm still learning on this as well. Then. <laughs> Aren't we all? Well, thanks, Anne. We wanted you to... Oh, we've got one more question, Andrew. Andrew Scanlon. Isn't science losing the marketing debate everywhere a little bit? Even Dr Carl would kind of uh, agree to that. Oh, I think it is. And um, I think that means that it's it's more important um, than ever. And that's why I think we need some, some advocates for the scientific process. Um, it's... Um, there's lots of information out there, silver bullets, and, and some of them will be right. And scientists and scientists may be grown worse than me sometimes. Um, but um, I think we need to all collective sort of advocate for the scientific process and encourage it. Great. Well, Ian, we wanted you up front. Oh, sorry, one more question, Rex. Wait just a second, Rex. Wait for the microphone. We have time for you. Last um, question. I guess more of a comment than a question, but having come from a retail background where you're presented with a lot of silver bullets to sell to your customers, um, I think perhaps if the advisors get closer to the retail outlets and encourage a, a longer term view of profitability for their clients rather than the quick sell, that might be a way in for advisors and to get that message through to producers. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and we wanted you up front to uh, set the scene for the day and you've done a fantastic job of that. As a livestock advisor myself, uh, it's, it was a fantastic presentation and it, it really um, nailed the complexities of dealing with, with livestock versus crop and other aspects of business. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking Anne. Thanks very much, right, Thank you, Ed. Enjoy your day.